All right, hello everybody. Welcome to BFM Season 4, Week 5. Don't mind the Week 7 on my thing. It doesn't show the right maps anyways. I'm here again with Saruman of Many Colors, my co-host for this evening. Hello, uh, MRBC League uh, viewers. It's great to be back again after recovering from what was an extremely wild set of games between CSJ and Imperial. Uh, lots of excitement, and while these teams might not have the exact skill level that those two juggernauts have, I think that we can still be entrusted for some promising games. 2 to 8th and Merch Star fighting for the number one spot. Both are neck and neck. This is going to decide Div C, which, if there's anything we've learned from Mech to Dane, is the most exciting and climactic division in the history of uh, sports. You got that right. And in rate, uh, I think last time I looked, it was 3-1 to one for uh, what can I think of the team. 42 was down against White Knight Legion that was just shown on MRBC1. So if you've been here, you've been watching that. And, now and that here. game was exciting in its own. Um, saw a lot of great play. Uh, saw Bowser tearing things up, or Broton, as he should be known now, tearing things up with his ATM mech. Uh, saw some good play from players like Texan Scrub Lord charging in. Also saw a lot of good play from players like Saiso, who was doing very well in the Assassin. And on the other side, 42, striking valiantly, Tolson and his lovable band of answerable people uh, trying to swing the game back. I mean, they did have a good drop, too, so they took that one. I did not see it, but I did watch drop four... Three, four, and f almost five as we had to start this. So drop four was another one they tried to brawl out because drop three did not go well for them playing the long range game. So, well, I can tell you right now that um, <laughs> uh, brawling is 42's, uh, it's their bread and butter. It's what they known for it, and they're known very much for their unconventional versions of brawling but uh right now i think what we should do is go into these teams 2 2 8th um death from above people should know very well after the match with Cameron's highlanders where they pulled off a very convincing win against a fairly good team but uh what do you know about Merkstar star uh, belmont I, I remember talking to i can't remember who it was from Merkstar. star it might have been kamichi uh, that they've been around for a while they just took some like a, a more than a year long break away from competitive to freshen up and try other things so they came back for this because they said they did bfm before i believe so some of the names are familiar you might see think you know xavier from net battletech but that is not the same guy so don't mistake him i don't know what the name difference is or how they're spelled differently but they are pretty close so i and a lot of other people has mixed that up but this is the decider because they are tied in group two right now for points so both of these guys want it and have the skills to make it move up, so it'll be interesting to see. Well, if there's one thing that's interesting, it's um, despite what Kamichiwa claims with Merkstar, I can say that despite spending uh, six years playing MechWarrior Online, uh, four to five of those competing in divisions all the way ranging from E to A, I don't really recognize any of these names. Black Templars, Raptors, Kamichiwa himself, James Bomb, Xavier, Prototellus, True the Blue. None of these guys really um, ring a bell. Uh, this seems like a very new team. Now, it could be because I haven't paid much attention to the competitive scene recently. I am unfortunately a year removed, so forgive me if some of these names are more established and I'm unable to recognize them. But from where I'm seeing, it seems like looking at uh, the Jarl's board and looking at what Merkstar has achieved, it feels like that they don't really have any true standouts, that it's just an extremely solid group of guys that are able to take individual strengths and weaknesses to work together to form a cohesive team. Yeah, I know I recognize Prototelis, but like you said, there's a lot of names I don't recognize. But I also jump on at weird times, so I'm not on for very long. And it looks like we're ready to go launching. Should be an exciting match. Loading into Terra Therma right now. Uh, Belmont, you want to start reading the mess list, the mech lists when they. I will do. Also, I'd like to <laughs> remind everybody I will try my damnedest not to have a radio cast tonight since we have already had one on the MRBC1 page. 
So hopefully that doesn't happen again. I've been good so far. I haven't had one yet. You know, working. You know, nothing wrong with a radio cast. Some people can appreciate some old school casting. All we have to do is uh, practice our fast voice, our auction voice. You know, hey, can I? Hey, bada bada. Hey, bada bada. Can I get a one, one, two, one hundred dollars? You know, just, just sling it. All right. So let's take a look. Merkstar bringing three Kentaro 18s. I am excited about this. Two Assassin 21s and an Urban Mech. What do you got on the 228 side? Uh, right now, 228 is going all in on the Huntsman, uh, bringing in the Streak deck. Lawrence Elsa bringing the Kit Fox G, Mad Dog A on a nuclear weapon, Kit Fox Prime for Pickle Rick. Uh, the last time we interviewed Seabiscuit, they did talk about... Oh, no, this is the wrong mode. Oh. Uh... Oh, boy. <laughs> Not Conquest. Not Conquest. That's so uh, weird. I... Could have sworn it was a conquest when the lobbies. Go quickly into the night. <laughs> That's interesting. I thought it was conquest. I am extremely sorry about that, chat. Uh, rips for this match. Um, rips for uh, unfortunate. Uh, and rip for redrops. Which which does suck, because everybody has seen the deck now, so... Hopefully they play it legit and don't, uh... Don't watch well, right the stream. Now, if they do it quick like enough. The decks, are, the decks are definitely similar, though, so I'm not sure that there's much to be gained or lost. Uh, in this redrop, obviously rules state that you can't change mechs, you can't change players, you just gotta ready up. So if these teams don't ready up immediately, something will definitely be afoot and we'll have to address it. Uh, Belmont, real quick though, could you take a screenshot of this, just so we have proof that everyone's going to be dropping in the same mech? Ugh, you make it like I know how to use screenshots on this piece of shit. Alright, I got it. Never mind. It's okay, that's what I have a camera phone for. Huzzah! I think I got it too. <laughs> uh, print screen. Good old fashioned print screen key. I don't know, it doesn't, but, uh, doesn't work on mine, which blows. But it was okay because we didn't show any what they were bringing, so we just showed them what they had. And they all know now, anyway, so. Yeah, but as I said, nobody's able to change mech. All right, it's set to conquest. Teams are locked. Nobody should change anything. It looks like they didn't. Two two eighth. Merc Star being gentlemen and scholars, honoring their word. So we got that gaff out of the way. Should have a clean cast for the rest of the night. Ah, uh, don't jinx. It. <laughs> Do not jinx it. So I expect to see much of the same decks this time around. So. Just with the, they can only touch Capacita Epsilon in this map. If they decide to touch Sigma or Gamma, they will have to defeat the other team before the cap win has been established. As per the rules. And it looks like the decks are exactly the same. Both teams did not change anything. Huntsman P's, Mad Dog A's, Kit Fox G, and Prime on 228th IBR, while Merc Stars got the Urban Mech. Two assassins and three Kentaros. Yep. Well, during our interview period with Seabiscuit, he covered this before. He wants his team to try and use a deck that can guarantee him the highest percentage chance of victory. And 228 Death from Above lives and dies by the streak deck. They feel extremely confident that they could pull out an early win. And then they feel that from that early win, they can gain a lot of momentum. But Belmont, what are you seeing, buddy? Yeah, because I'm looking at that streak deck from 228, and that is going to be a tough one. Because I remember last time they dropped a lot of Arties and they dropped a lot of UAVs to get locks quickly on these guys. Whoever they played last time, which I can't remember. Cameron's Highlanders. Although I'm looking at a lot of SRMs from these Kentaro, so this should be interesting. As well as Flamers. And interestingly enough, it seems as though uh, 228A is definitely going for the full momentum on Theta. Their light was definitely somewhat slow to Epsilon, so the cap advantage is going to go to Merkstar. But it seems as though the 228 IBR is going to be the first one to get to Theta, which is beneficial to them. The problem with this map for streaks, though, is that 
it's going to be super hot, right? And the Assassins, while they'll get eviscerated by the Streaks, the Kentaros might be a bit more tankier, and that's going to be an issue. Plus, the Urban Mech is another mech with insane armor quirks, so this Streak deck might not be as surefire of a victory as 228's Death from Above thinks. But what are you seeing right now, Belmont? It looks like some big movements are happening. Well, I did vote. I forgot to mention, but I was keeping it a secret. Merkstar is prepared for Streaks. These Kentaros and one of the Assassins have AMS on them, which it might just be enough to save them from a little bit of streak damage, so we'll see how this turns out. And it actually does. I would like to point this out. Uh, during my time when I was playing under Wonka for Seraphim Rising Storm, we did some tests with AMS, and while it didn't stop all the missiles, it did stop enough to be able to delay the damage and allow the brawl to happen. And Merkstar is moving in right now, pushing with their SRM mechs. The brawl is getting fierce. 86% down for the Assassin. Black Templar's Raptors in his Urban Mech 60 is almost ganked, but Pickle Rick and his Kit Fox is also taking a lot of damage. But Black Templar's Raptors down. Belmont, what do you see? Oh, well, how do you explain this? It is a cluster F of action going on here. Even like they said, Pickle Rick getting hurt 65% with four streaks and three AMS as well on his side. These Both of these teams were prepared for missiles. Although, look at these guys, these Kentaros with the Flamers. They are trying Flame? to make, trying to yeah, make them Flamers overheat. Yeah, Flamers and SRMs. Crazy. I mean, it looks like it's definitely working, that's for sure. We are four and three for Merkstar. And it seems as though the AMS might have done its job. Uh, Kamichi was down 17%, but the Kentaros that brought the multitude of the AMS are untouched. And this is where the heat of the streak kind of hurts. 228, death from above. Those are very hot mechs, and they're getting... They're turning into ovens, basically, through those flamers. I feel bad for the pilots inside those mechs. Right now, they're probably toasting. They make a great clanner IS pilot stake, and they're going to finish out the drop with Lawrence Selvins uh, pretty much shutting down. That Kit Fox does not have enough heat sinks to supplement all those streaks, and this match is going to go to Merkstar, who somewhat brilliantly did their homework. They knew that 228th, Death from Above, brings streaks to try and give themselves the best way to win possible, the best way they feel they can win possible. So very good on them. This is definitely a team that showed that they did their homework and they adjust their game plan to who they play against. Yeah, and a well job done. I mean, look at that. Still got 92% on Proto Talos, who was basically barely shot at all with Drew the Blue as well. 46, close to death, but still, still alive and well. This is probably a testament to the fact that 228th Death from Above's focus fire was actually very solid, but it seemed as though the AMS kind of held on, and this is kind of what I was getting on when I was... Uh fighting with Seraphim and Wonka, we did a ton of AMS tests with streaks, specifically clan streaks, and what we found was that with enough AMS, you could definitely delay the streaks enough to mitigate some of the damage and possibly save a mech in the process uh, in the brawl, and this is exactly what they did, and you combine the AMS managing to take off a couple of missiles and shave off some DPS from the streaks with the high heat of the map and the heat coming off the Kentaro's flamers, and it was a win recipe for uh, Merkstar. Uh, they definitely counter-stratted them, and, you know, this was a battle that was won in the mech lab. Yeah, I mean, I was took a look at the builds. Lawrence, or pick whichever Kit Fox they did bring, did bring three times AMS, but just, yeah, like I said, with the AMS across the board for the Kentaros and the Assassin, it was just a, a done deal for them. Looking at the damage now, Kamichiwa leads the pack with 524 damage in the Assassin, 100 from James Bomb, 00420, Black Templar's Raptors bringing 14 damage, only two more than Panic Button on his worst day. Uh, Prototellus doing 357 with two kills, four assists, Drew the Blue, 372, Xavier 297. So even damage across the board except from the Urban Mech and the Assassin from Merkstar's side. Now on 228's side, damage is once more spread across uh, three hundreds from the Huntsman, except Seabiscuit, who only did 191. Nuke got focused down super early in the Mad Dog, doing 180. Lawrence, 369. And Pickle Rick, 292 in the Kid Foxes. I think this is something to be said, too. This is also part of Merkstar's homework. They identify that nuclear weapon has been extremely has been playing extremely well for Merkstar. Um, I wouldn't say he's a carry, but I would definitely say that he is 
extremely good, and he has been doing a great service to 228th Death from Above in these matches. So I think it was extremely smart for Merckstar to pretty much single him out. I'm not sure if they did it because of the mech he was in or because of his pilot name, but brilliant maneuver by Merckstar. Yeah, and I mean, you, when you, I mean, for the way they've been paying attention to what kind of drops that they were going to be bringing, I assume they're going to pay attention to what guys are from higher up in the placements in the R list and such like that. that you want to take out quick. Be no different than Bowser playing for the White Knight, right? You know you should take him out first. It'd be tough, but something you should try to do. Definitely, and it looks like they achieved that since Nuclear Weapon was contained to 187 damage. Now, not to take anything away from 228, the match was still close even with his early departure, but uh, in the end, that tonnage lost and that pilot skill and experience lost definitely helped teeter the balance. This is a big morale boost from Merckstar. Uh, it'll be interesting to see it carry this momentum in the match, too. Yeah, well, now they seem to be bringing an RJ base, so we have the, uh, the man, 228 man himself, rolling into the deck. So this will be interesting. He's been long with be. DFA for a long time, so as well as a longtime streamer for Mecha Warrior Online. Well, you seem to know him better than I do. What does RJ bring to the table for this? Well, I know RJ loves his long range. And he, when he was focusing with two two eight, they worked on a lot of long range decks and such like that. So. Which is interesting because against. Cameron's Highlanders, he brought an Orion 2C a lot. He was a, a very hardcore brawler for those matches, but um, yeah, I guess it'll be interesting to see how this match develops with RJ in the folds. Can be a bit more rangy with a lighter deck, or see if uh, they'll go for the default brawl pushes. Yeah. I mean, it did work for them well against Cameron's Highlanders, but like I said, MS has been paying attention, and working hard to stay at the top here so since they are technically they are one up on 228 rich now which makes them first place so we will see how this goes so it looks like we got a little bit of time to get over to the map strat and maybe talk about uh what merc star and 228's movements were yeah we could do that i got the raffle going on in the chat right now oh excellent That's yeah, we are good to go. Because we had what? 228? Yeah, because we had basically both teams running in from. Because who touched? Was it MS who touched Epsilon? Yes. No, it wasn't MS that touched Epsilon. It was, um. I believe it was 228 that touched Epsilon. That's correct. And they yeah, were the they ones were that pushed side. forward. Mm -hmm. they, they were, were the ones that pushed forward and got into Theta. <laughs> oh, and it uh, looks like while we were already discussing the map strat, both teams are locked. Oh, well, then I will stop this raffle in the chat and get that. Oh, no one's going to like me. Yeah, unfortunately, Matt. The match comes before the prizes, sad to say. Even though I would probably guess that a bunch of people watch the stream specifically for the prizes. Well, I hope so, because I got shit tons to give away again, so these people better be here. And we're launching now. Match starting Conquest Terra Therma, 12 minutes, first person only. Okay, no more gas. And Mike Shen has taken it from Moobot, so he's got a mech bay on his side now. So hopefully he's paying attention. Because I will run the, as soon as the match is done in my time, I will start the raffle for the Twitch. So for everybody else won't even notice. Reminding me, let's get into the game here. Hopefully Mikkei Shen contacts me so I can give him some mech bay. Well, worst case scenario, we could send him a message. So, what are you seeing mech-wise from Merkstar and Two Two A's? What in the fuck? Hold on, I am incapacitated. There we go. 
two, two, um, two, two, eight, bringing a piranha assassin onion two ca from rj bringing the brawler again another assassin piranha from pickle rick who he was in before i believe and another onion two ca from seabiscuit what do you got merc star side merc star brought a nova s which is going to be super hot i question that choice from crimson helix but it's a merc star strategy not mine three bushwhacker p2s i'm guessing those are ballistics and arctic wolf probably loaded with srms and a piranha one traditional machine gun boat to fight off the heat inefficiency of this map and once again epsilon was captured faster merc star taking advantage of the cat lead unlike uh, 228 death from above in the first match and uh, both teams seem to be moving out right now uh, from Kappa. Um, no, no. Sorry about that. 228 is moving out right now from Kappa. Meanwhile, Merkstar just seems to be languishing around Epsilon's side. And it looks like, from what we're seeing from the mechs, it looks like Merkstar is pushing around Theta. They're not pushing into Theta. And they're going to try and catch the back of 228's array. The assassin isn't seeing much belmont what are you seeing right now yeah i've been watching the 228 side as they roll in towards theta so now watching Merkstar mosey their way in around to try and flank although they are taking a wide berth on this flank but it's true you do not want to go through the lava as it will heat you up like heck in these mechs and this wide berth is definitely a questionable movement because right now it seems like yeah, it, oh boy, it seems like Puts them yeah, Merc Star gave up. They could have been all right on, was it Lawrence Elsa who was right in the back? I believe it was. Uh, no, that was the Assassin nuclear weapon, or Seneschal, that saw the, that scouted out the maneuver. And it looks like 228 is going to circle around now. Interesting to see if they would go for an Epsilon cap, but it looks like they're going to stay grouped. And this is uh, straight out of the NASCAR playbook. <laughs> if I didn't know any better, I'd say this is almost a I mean, this also puts two two or Merkstar in a good position to receive the push from two two eight because right now they could take back Theta and just drop UAVs on either side of these entrances and just wait, see what they want to do. And it looks like uh, Merkstar her read your mind almost since they're setting up to receive the push. They're using the lava corridor as kind of a slim viewpoint to trade effectively with 228 and 228 really doesn't have any trading mechs they're all brawl and meanwhile Merc Star brought the pushwhacker p2s i believe this comes once again with Merc Star's uh, homework they knew that uh, 228 likes the brawl so they brought a little extra range and range with speed mind you to try and zone out 228's push attempts yeah because it looks like they're going to try and make a push back into theta here just waiting for those orions to or they're just waiting for eyes on them, maybe. With the nuclear there on the side. But yeah, you can see Merkstar knows what's going on. Just waiting. And the push right now is a little bit disjointed. The Orions are up front, which is something I don't necessarily agree with because they'll get focused easily. Piranha's up front too. That's a decent target to be up front so long as he doesn't run out too early. Orions are engaging and the brawl's happening. And right now, the Orions are getting lit up, it seems like. Drew the Blue down 70%, 63 for the Bushwhacker P2. That's the focus target called for 228th. And he's already down from nuclear weapon. And the brawl is just evolving. Machine gun fire spreading. Bushwhackers are starting to fall like trees. Xavier down 76%. Kamichiwa down 90 Orion 2C, 64%. Yeah, RJ's, RJ's been RJ. legged too, yeah. Oh my goodness. RJ's been legged too. What else do you see? Although, I mean, Merkstar's down three to the one on 228 side now. But we'll see if these piranhas can do the do what they need to do to finish off these mechs here. It'll be interesting to see because even though there's a lot injured on 228 IBR, which is perfect for the piranha. Oh, well, now there's only one piranha. Uh, yeah, it uh, looks like the match was cleaned up. Um, the push was successful. Yeah, no, that was... A Heck of a good push coming in, focus targets, finish them off. I do like the movement from the Piranha. Um, whether it was Pickle Rick or Lawrence Elsa, I unfortunately didn't get a chance to see, but I liked what the Piranhas did. They made it seem as though they were going to engage, then fainted back behind the Orions. So what that kind of did, I'm guessing, was muck up Merc Star's crosshair placement a little bit. The Piranhas are very low mechs, so as a result, it would take some time to adjust. They thought they were shooting Piranhas, and then before they knew it, Orions were in their faces. 
Yeah, we got Senestral and Lawrence trying to take a Prototellus right now, where Senestral is almost legged. Whereas Lawrence at 41%, I believe he is. Too fast for me to grab, obviously. Core CT red, so he is in dangerous position. I don't know what Merkstar can do with that Piranha at this point. And looking at Prototellus, his right leg is uh, dark orange, his center torso is orange, left leg light orange. This is all armor, mind you, but take into account that the Piranha's very low armor values means that dark orange means that there's only about probably four points, four or five points of armor in that leg. So all an assassin or uh, another light needs to do is just brush a small laser or a couple of SRMs and that leg's already open, a couple more SRMs and lasers, and then it's legged. The Piranha looks like it's trying to bring the game back by capping, but I don't see how he's going to win. This just seems like a, an unfortunate attempt. Um, I would say that the game is going heavily to T2A so long as the Piranhas don't split and so long as the mechs that are super open, like Nuclear Weapons Assassin 23 and RJ's Orion 2CA, don't go off alone. Yeah, no, I there's, there's no way to win the cap win. All they gotta do is hold Theta and if they keep switching Kappa Epsilon, it's we might be in for a long wait if they don't want to try and finish or find him to finish him. But you know what? This is what you look for in comp games. This is what you look for from the team. You look for that fight. You look for that effort to put in. Prototellus, despite the fact that he's outnumbered, is still trying to play, and he's still trying to find an opening. And you can bet that in Merc Star's comms, they're cheering him on. That's hard, you know? Yeah. Like, a lot of people would try stupid maneuvers, suicidal maneuvers, and they try and plan and move on to the next match, but at least Prototellus is showing, hey, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to try and, you know, maybe make a name for myself, maybe pull a Queen Blade or pull a self from yesterday in BFM, take out some injured mechs, try and change the game as much as I can. Yeah, because like I said, with three down mechs like they have, there's always a chance. I mean, they two would be silly enough to send them off on their way to die, but... And it looks like they read your mind, Belmont, since right now they're all grouping up on Theta. This Piranha would have to charge into a huge pack of mechs. There is no reason for them to really separate. And even if the Piranhas have to go and cap a point far off, 41 and 37% isn't ideal. But I believe that the Piranhas still have guns. And they do. Pickle Rick is legged, so he really can't go anywhere. And it looks like Prototellus is already on him right now. Yep, he wants to try and finish him off from range. Oh, but Pickle Rick is not playing this smart. He exposed his right leg. No. Oh, man. Somebody needs to duel that guy a couple of times. Somebody needs to learn teach Pickle Rick about leg placement. But it doesn't even matter anyway because Lawrence Self finishes Prototellus. And this series is tied up 1-1 with 2 2 IBR picking up the win on drop two. Yeah. No, that was a good win. Good brawl for them off the bat, too. And what do you see from damage numbers? I am just updating the thing right now. But I'm looking at RJ335, the highest match damage so far in that Onion 2C. But good damage all around from everybody. A bit low on two of those bushwhackers, but I mean, if they were focused quick, then there's nothing you could do, right? And like you said, that Nova that Crimson from MS brought, only doing 220, it is a tough mech to bring with that because he had 12 small lasers, not pulse, so, but they're still hot. Like, that's that's still so much heat to put out. If you screw that up once, and you overheat, you're exposed. Pretty much, and Drew the Blue was the bushwhacker that got focused, so it's obvious why he only did 108 damage. RJ tanking like a hero, 335 is a very impressive number. It's interesting to note, though, that the damage numbers being low is not just telling of the tonnage values, but it's also telling of the focus. Whether there was a lack of torso twisting or whether one team was a bit more focused than the other, it seemed as though 228's damage numbers were able to be kept low, we just knew what components to focus. Uh, just Judging by how the mechs died, it looks like they were focusing legs or torsos on specific mechs, depending on their strengths or weaknesses. And overall, it was a very strong match coming in from 2 to 8. Their focus fire was excellent, and it was a very well-played push. Like I said, the Piranhas kind of stymied the push beginning, screwing up the... Uh, the crosshair placement of uh, Merc Star a little bit because they were aiming low while the Orions are obviously more high. And 
two eighth were very good shuffling mix in and out, and it's part of the reason why they won. Yeah. So now we're moving on to Rubelite Oasis, and I believe our maximum tonnage is Faux Honey. Changing that right now, sir. Yeah, 400 tons max. Excellent. And teams are left the same, correct? Yep, they stay. We flip them next time. Sorry, my memory is occasionally that of a squirrel, so I have to be reminded. It is not a problem. <laughs> People already spamming the you have been permanently banned from this channel oh. meme in the MRBC chat. That's a yeah, but I'd like to explain to everybody that when we flip the teams, the MRBC tool that we use to display stuff does not flip them. It's in-game that we flip them, so the scores will be correct, but as you can see, it sits over the title of the the mechs, so I don't feel like doing all the work to change that. Well, I think people can understand. You know, it's not like... Uh... It's not as though our um, viewers are dull knives in the tool shed, you know, or worn out screwdrivers. They, I think, if you uh, catch my uh, metaphorical lingo. Yeah. Because what do we got? Still waiting for MS to ready up. Both teams are ready, not ready to. So while we're waiting, let's go into the map strat. Belmont, what did you see from these movements? Let me get it up here. Yes. I mean, we had Merkstar who came in, and they went around. Oh, I'm going to screw this right up. Because they went Epsilon, and we thought they were going to come in G7, and they went all the way around H7 and back up. If I'm correct, mm -hmm. and then basically tried to hold uh, the territory here. Whereas if I get another color, two two eight. Ah, uh, stupid red on red. There we go. <laughs> two two eight came up, took theta, and then went around the back, and kind of got stuck in the fox. That's gamete. Sorry, in the gamete section until they came back in and push the brawl until one was left and then basically that was when who the hell was it? Prototelus. Prototelus ran to Kappa, capped it back for MS and then had tried to come back to Theta to see what he could do because there were a lot of five, three her 228 mechs out of five so he did get Pickle Rick in the end but it was just not enough it's interesting to note that during the period where the teams were fighting over this uh, choke point right here, that um, Merkstar, while getting some damage out, definitely probably didn't want the damage that they needed in order to get the Brawl Mix down to where they needed them to be for when they eventually pushed. Percentages were pretty much untouched, so it's unfortunate that uh, Merkstar wasn't really able to take full advantage of their longer range decks. The Bushwhackers were just not able to land their shots as effectively as they would have liked, I felt. And the overall, 228 didn't really overexpose that much either. Once they saw that uh, Merkstar had them locked in at this uh, lava flume, they just did exactly what your blue marker indicated. They turned around and pushed through the main corridor of Theta with uh, victorious results. And it looks like they're ready, so let's get into this. Drop three, Rubelite. And you say Rubelite is a hot map, right? It is still a warm map, that's for sure, yes. And I'm sorry if I interrupted you, what were you saying? Someone is messing with my raffles on the Twitch page. I keep resetting it. I was trying to let it ride until right before we start the match. Hmm. Because once I get in the match, I don't want to come back. Freaking gay. Well, worst case scenario, we can dish out prizes the old-fashioned one. Let's 
Seneschal and RJ Bass wishing everyone good luck except Nuclear Weapon with his uh, <laughs> with his trademark die, die, and rage quit, which he's been carrying for the past six years, although he did change it up by wishing a GL to uh, Merkstar as they drop in. Do you have the game open, Belmont? You want to read? I do. I am here. A Merkstar side. We got Xavier and Crimson, linebacker Prime, Skamichua and Black Templar, Raptor in the Roughneck, as well as Drew the Blue and Prototelis in the last linebacker, the H variant. What do you got on the 228 side? On the 228 side, they definitely prepared for the heat efficiency part more. It looked like the it looks like their decks a little bit more DACA rather than the laser heavy focus of Merkstar, which I can't agree with on a map as hot as this. Warhammer six Rs from 228 IBR. I believe that those have more ballistic are more ballistic hard points. Miss Lynx's G's and B's from Lawrence Elsa and Pixel Rick, most likely filled to the brim with machine guns and heat efficient small lasers. And then you got the Fafnir 5 from Shenasol and the Annihilator. Annihilator 2A from Nuclear Weapon. Oh, man. Nuclear Weapon. This is definitely a case of put your best player in the best mech. If that guy does not get taken down, we could easily see a 500 to 800 damage match from Nuclear Weapon to carry this event. Yeah, I guess those are some heavy, massive mechs here. Some big damage mechs, that's for sure. Interestingly enough, normally it's 228 that brings the linebackers. They're the ones that kind of made them famous in MRBC. They skillfully deploy them as flankers, but once again, this is Merkstar studying 228's uh, tendencies and studying their strategies, taking a page out of their book, trying to potentially gain a win by pushing Theta early and then using the linebacker's speed to get some nice flanks and lay down some amazing burst damage. And if early trades are coming in, what do you see, Belmont? Yeah, I'm just watching the linebackers head into the ditch there. As trying to go low under cover to swing around and try to attack some of those heavier mechs. And right now it's just the Mislinks G's that are holding that position. The linebackers really can't shoot them because they're on the top platform while the Mislinks are right under them, kind of camping the lower platform, keeping themselves from being shot. But this looks like a concentrated push from Merkstar right now. The Fafnir is getting lit up by SRMs brought by the linebackers. They are not all lasers. Although, oh no, this is not good. It looks like the one of the mechs, yes, the Roughneck pushed him by himself and he got nuked. Drew the Blue making a terrible mistake getting picked early by 228's excellent fire and the linebackers are just climbing into the, each other this is not a good brawl Merkstar is getting hammered right now and while nuclear weapons down to 32% the rest of the mechs on 228 are pretty okay the Fafnir is at 59% from Seneschal Lawrence Celsius still 63% of the mislinks yeah. but Seneschal goes down what's going on Belmont what are you saying yeah I watched the uh, legged Xavier get taken up by Sea Biscuit and Pickle Rick in the mislinks I mean, it is still a cluster F out there, but a lot of, a lot of strong mechs still on the Merkstar side. Whereas you got Nuclear Weapon, who's almost a stick, and now Lawrence Elson Sea Biscuit just hurt. Um, this is not going well though. The linebackers are almost completely out of action. Both linebacker primes are dead. Roughnecks are extremely low right now. Kamichua down to 49%. The missed links is from Lawrence Elsa are down, and I want to see if Nuke has weapons. He still has medium lasers. He lost his ACs, and it seems like he lost them fairly early, but the linebackers on the other side, Prototelis, is already rear open, and this does not seem like it could go that well. Oh, Prototelis already overheated. Very bad choice. Wasted damage on his front. And Black Templars manages to bring Pickle Rick. But, wow, it looks like that Merkstar, despite the disjointed push and the early pick, might win this. I don't know. Yeah, because they're going to take out Nuclear Weapon right here. And now we only have the barely alive Lawrence Elsa in the Mislinks. And he's got that speed. He might be able to Unless Black Templar can find him when he crosses the map and finish him off. This is all down to Lawrence Elsa, who admittedly does have a lot of experience uh, in pug drops and in CW drops. He's a fairly highly rated player, especially according to the Jarl's leaderboards. And he plays with some high-level players like Ash, Juju Shinobi, used to play with Odin Steed, who was in his prime, probably one of the best range traders in the game. 
And it's going to be up to him to kind of use what he's learned from these players and use what he learned in previous drops to try and outcap Merkstar, which is a Herculean feat with one cap. We have to wait 600 seconds. That translates to 10 minutes of cap fest if we truly think that 228 can carry this out. Yeah, and looking at that damage on Lawrence Elsa, no weapons, legs are both open, yellow and orange, CT rear, torso, orange and yellow, and even the armor in the front is red. So, oh. I mean, he's pulling a wide berth to get cap points, but at this point... And the most and the most interesting part about this is that the original brawl was so ugly. Like, I don't mean to derail what Merkstar has done. They definitely took this match back and they brought the focus fire and the pain and their superior burst fire linebackers with the missiles, despite being extremely hot due to their high alpha, even with SRMs, doing a lot of damage. Like, the push just looked so ugly at the beginning. Drew the Blue got picked in his Roughneck 3A early. Crimson Helix and Xavier were bumping into each other for the push, not even getting fire dropped down on uh, 228 Smecs, but it looks like it didn't matter. I... This battle may have been won in the mech lab, and it might have also been won due to 228's close proximity to the brawl. They really didn't get much distance, and they really didn't use the range that they had. Well, like you said, that close proximity, it did not work out well for Nuclear Weapon, who, when he got taken out, he got taken out quick. I mean, not like Drew the Blue quick, but an assault losing its weapons and being a higher-end player losing his stuff like that is not good for the team. So it, exactly. it definitely hurt 228. And you can see Lawrence here, he's just... I don't I don't think Black Jumper knows how wrecked he is. Because like I said, it would be so risky for Lawrence to push. Like, maybe he's going to try and take Theta right now. But he uh, he's in such a dangerous position. Because I'd expect him to take Theta, push Epsilon, and then... Once Black's got Kappa, take Theta back, and then just... Basically from there, you just watch it. Well, interestingly enough, it looks like uh, one of the mechs from Merkstar is hanging back. Oh wait! Oh shoot! This is a this is a I'm I'm glitched right now. Prototeles is actually dead. It's just the roughneck left for um, Merkstar. Oh, yeah. spectator tool. Why you do this? <laughs> Here I was thinking that Merkstar had a 2-1 advantage, and it turns out it's just uh, Black Templar is running around in his roughneck. But, um, yeah, this is this is definitely a rough time going, but right now it seems like Lawrence Elsa is still having the cap lead. We're at 206 seconds, 550 more seconds to go of capping, assuming if Lawrence Elsa is just going to rely on one point. This is still not good, though, as Lawrence Elsa was unable to actually gain control of the center, and he wasn't able to establish a two-cap lead, so the points were never actually ticking. This... I can't really say that I agree with that. He needs to cap as quickly as possible, since this is what it's going to come down to. It's going to come down to how many points he can snag, and whether or not he can truly ride down that 200 point. Well, right now, actually, I'm sorry to correct myself. A hundred point advantage that he has over Merkstar. Yeah, I mean, showing me uh, UAVs on the mini map, but I can't see nothing, so I don't know. Like, I, I can't see them being there anymore. But Lawrence, uh, that if, might, that might, yeah, that might be a glitch too, yeah. But if Lawrence Elsa has those eyes on where he's coming from, although if he's, if he's looking right now, and, and right now oh, yeah. Black Templar, yeah, uh, what are you seeing? Black is he's seen Lawrence now, so he's coming in for the kill. Not smart, and this is coming from Lawrence moving up on the open plane. It seemed like he was trying to go the shortcut through Theta, take the open ground around oh. the up, yep, and he got shot. And that's it. All he's got to do is decap Epsi, and they are good to go for the win. If I was in Lawrence's shoes, I would have tried to move to the right side from Epsilon, take the long route, and just try and go straight for Theta while Protocellus was capping. But, um, yeah, I guess Lawrence's own kind of experiences on this map might have betrayed him. He took a very open route that Raptors was able to see and picked him off. Yep. And yeah, I think he was just hoping, hoping he was going to go wide on it. But yeah, with that much damage on your mech, you got to be careful.
Well, it was a tall order anyway. 32% in a miss links. That's only... I want to say that's only about uh, perhaps somewhere around 70 to 60 points total of armor. And if we look at uh, Black Templar's Raptor's weaponry, he's got eight medium pulse lasers, even assuming that all 70 points of his armor left are in one component that Raptors would have to destroy. He could take that component off in, I believe, two alphas. So it's an extremely tall, and that 70 points of armor in the Mistlings, that's distributed throughout his entire mech, so it's an extremely tall order to expect Elsa to outcap him. But once again, great effort. Yeah, no, it was a good job on Merkstar's part. I definitely thought 228 had the, the better side of that until, like you said, until the, until the mech started dying, and then you're like, oh, oh. Flip mode. Yep, and now we wait. So tell me what you see with the damages. Oh, sorry, I was not in the game. Uh, damages right now. Uh, Drew the Blue surprisingly actually did a decent amount of damage before he dropped in his roughneck. 214, Kamichiwa dropping 400 in his roughneck. Black Templars over 400. Prototelis dropping 454, but Crimson Helix and Xavier, the two linebackers that were crashing into each other at the beginning, only doing 287 and 268. And Nuclear Weapon, despite getting stripped early, dropped almost 400 damage. Good effort from Nuke. Miss Lynx's from Lawrence Elsa and Pickle Rick. Pickle Rick doing almost 400. Lawrence Elsa doing 310. 271 from Sea Biscuit, who was one of the first Warhammers taken out of the action. And RJ pulling in an admirable over 400 damage. What I'm seeing from this is that 228 definitely struggled to focus fire effectively. Because if you look purely at damage numbers, it looks as though 228 won. But the linebacker's huge burst damage, which is what it's always been known for, whether it's with lasers or missiles, that high speed and that high burst damage is kind of what allowed Merkstar to pull it out in the end. And even with Drew the Blue getting picked very early, he still did an admirable amount of damage. Whether that was from strikes or weapons, I'm not sure. But in the end, it, it counted and it allowed uh, Merkstar to win the brawl in the end. Yeah, no, it was definitely a, an interesting brawl from that point. And now we switch the team. Yes, sir. So it'll be interesting to see what they bring this time. I'm ex I'd like to say I'm expecting a long range deck for this time. But I mean, the Brawl deck almost went in favor of 228 this time as well as it did in drop two. So I don't want to say Merxar got lucky on that, but I mean, they definitely played it well, played it smart. Just I'm other, thinking... other than Drew the Blue having that really, that really tough love on the push was like i'm going guys it's like oh we we went uh the second corner bud uh sorry i, I forgot to say that <laughs> <laughs> oh that's probably too accurate and that's kind of what happens off jointed pushes and i think orbit rain might have summed it up best when we interviewed him when you're having new teams especially in div c it's much easier to coordinate pushes rather than coordinate range traits uh twinkie overlord said something that was very 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 true and he kind of emphasized it and drilled it during his time in swk and imperial you are responsible for your own position so when you're trading range, if you're not in position, that's you and you alone, and that's something only you can improve. No strategy can help you with that, whereas if you go in with a brawl strat, you can kind of mitigate your lack of skill in knowing where to properly position yourself. Not saying Merc Scar 228 deaths from above don't know how to properly position themselves, but it's definitely a problem that happens in range trading. You kind of have to be more independent, whereas in these brawl pushes, you can be a bit more cohesive, or in these DACA responses you can be a little bit more uh cohesive and attached because the movements are a bit more simple the ranges are less extreme and Hold overall on. it's easier to coordinate do you want to move sea biscuit out of ms uh was he in ms oh my goodness jeez lease there we go now they're safe to to change up well i'm glad we haven't had to go to full cap yet because I know that just takes forever. As now 228 has their team, which hasn't changed much, and James Bombed is back in for MS, so we will wait for them to 
love the pun on his name, James Bond. It makes me wonder if uh, he's familiar with Jack. Dan Looking crazy. Love that kind of stuff. It's always it's always nice, you know, seeing what the MechWarrior community's names can come up with. Like, you know, you and I got these crazy long names. Uh, then you got James Bombed, Kamichiwa. Then you got, you know, Nuclear Weapon going the plain and simple route. Seneschal kind of going the more religious route, or maybe it represents death. It's it's nice to see the creativity that you're allowed with Piranha Gaming's uh, naming system. It's probably one of my favorite things about this game. There's so much freedom in coming up with your name. Yeah. Well, like, my name would be the same in Blizzard if they allowed that many characters to cheapskates. Exactly. There's not a lot of games that allow like that many much freedom with characters, spaces, all that stuff. And it looks like the teams might be ready, but we're going to give a final. Yes. Yeah, unfortunately, say they. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't really go into the map strap because they got ready very quickly. Which but, uh, is a shame, because, but I like, think that most people get the essence of it. It was a push, and you know... Yeah, just end, off of Theta, around the corner, with MS mm -hmm. trying to swing on one of the bottom decks, and then come up to where they were, where all their assaults were. Wasn't a bad idea. It definitely... I mean, it definitely hurt Nuclear, as well as, like I said, Drew for pushing out in the wrong way too early. So, I did do that in D4 last night, which sucked, because we did lose against... Uh, what the hell were we playing? Cross Clan Crossfire with Bowser and their team. Old Aussies uh, over there. No, don't you mean Kras Kras and Pasha. And pa yeah, we were talking about Bowser being for White Knight Legion earlier. And you know, giving Kras credit, like he's, I mean, he's a very good pilot. Oh, yeah. No, because I've, I've, since I joined the MRBC, I've been watching Kras and Kras and them and talking to him, so keeping tabs on these guys. For good reason, you know, like they're definitely an up and up team. It's going to be interesting to see what Kraz and his team of Aussies, along with the occasional Italian thrown in with Data and Boss, I believe. Back to Rubelite. Die, die, and rage quit. Favorite words from Nuclear Weapon. Love them for it. Trademark. Hope he never gives it up. Oops, wrong button. And I am looking at 228, so I'll tell you what I got. They got two Jaeger DDs, two Mad Cat 2Cs, an Arctic Wolf, and a Dragon 5N, which I will assume has the three Ultra 2s on it. So they have brought some long range for this one. What do you got on Merkstar's side? Merkstar is going what seems to be the opposite route. Uh, Crimson Helic and Black Templars, Raptors are in Orion, 2 CAs, Kamichiwa, Xavier, and the Wolfhound 1A, Mark, Mad Cat, Mark 2B, Drew the Blue, which I'm guessing is a DACA build, and then the Mad Cat, Mark 2B by James Bond, which could be a combination of DACA and lasers. Very interesting approach. 228 definitely recognizes that their side is the side that's more favorable to range. And it looks like that they're going to be taking advantage of it, but the problem is, is if those Jaeger mechs lose their arms early, and it's not hard since those arms are large, they will be combat ineffective at this point. Oh, and if you're watching Theta right now, Sinestral and that Arctic Wolf coming up on Kamichiwa on the Wolfhound, this is not going to be ending well for Kamichiwa with that streak. Four streak twos and three streak sixes. Sorry, I couldn't count it quick enough. On the Arctic Wolf, yes, yeah, Seneschal's chasing him off. I don't like what Seneschal's doing since he's going way too far from the team. Although, he needs to go back because if he gets in a 2v1 life fight, I'm not sure. Well, he does have backup right there in Xavier, and I think that's what he was going for, but still, that was not... I think that was the closest part of backup he had, or Xavier could probably called out he could help him. Well, yeah, I mean, that's what I was referring to. The Wolfhound 1As, Wolfhounds have a lot of armor, a surprising amount of armor. They can tank quite a few streaks, especially from a mech that's not as loaded as an Arctic Wolf. But right now, a streak, strike was dropped, didn't do much uh, from 228 side and a Merc Star, and it seems like the trades are still ongoing. Uh, Black Templars, Raptors, and the Orion 2CA, and Crimson Helix trying to edge themselves up, but they really need to close the gap since... I'm guessing that those are brawl builds. Let me just check real quick to make sure. 
yeah, they're brawl builds, so they really need to find a way to close this gap and beat this ranged trading position that 228 has set up. Otherwise, they're not going to get anywhere in this game. Yeah, because I like the Jaeger builds that they brought. That is my favorite build as well, so... What was the build? 5 AC, 2 Jaegers. Extreme range, extreme DPS. Uh, it's perfect for this match, and right now it seems like... Uh, 228 is just getting a little bit aggressive on the trades, but it seems like the Jaeger mechs are kind of missing their shots a little bit. Apart from Kamichiwa and Black Templar's Raptors, Merkstar is still relatively fresh, and once again, this is not something you want to see. You want to get as much damage as possible before they start closing the gap, and Merkstar and 228 recognizing that they have to have cap control in order for this range trap to work have sent their light to Epsilon, and meanwhile, Merkstar is trying to send their lights to Kappa to try and keep the cap lead, which they will lose unless they make a decisive action. Yeah, and it looks like James Bond was hit by an artillery strike or airstrike of some sort, because he is decent, but yellow all over, so they've got to find a way to close the distance here. And swing it around Epsilon. Oh, yeah. Might not I can be see that. James Bond did lose his... What do you think are some of the ways that they'll have to close the gap? I mean, if they come from the side that they're intending to close on, it's not a bad way. There's a lot of cover from the pillars on this side. And from, right now, it seems like... And they're focused, yes. yeah, they're definitely focused on the lights, Xavier and Kamichiwa. But they need to move quick if they want to do anything, which is going to be tough, because that is a long way around that map. Uh, and right now, these lights are getting so beat up. Kamichiwa at 69%. This is something that we saw in the end match that was a big bit blunder. You know, props to Kamichiwa for trying out for lights, but unfortunately, he can't hold a candle to Charlemagne's self, and they're like, when they exposed and took too much armor, it was a huge difference in the fight, and they found themselves unable to properly engage in light fights or harass and it seems like Kamichiwa is just giving away free armor at this point. 66%, he's just eating large lasers, and he's not trading. This is just not intelligent. And even though Kamichiwa is probably not open anywhere, and much of the damage is in his arms, that left shoulder is still open, the center torso is not looking that good, he really needs to conserve his light mech. Yeah, he... uh, but it looks like the push has started. What do you see on that other side, Bill? Yeah, I was just watching Xavier make a bad... Bad eyes on those Marauder 2Cs. Ah, I keep going into the freaking smog. But yeah, Drew the Blue and James Bond finally coming into fire, firing range. They are still quite a ways out, so they need to pick up their shoes and get moving here. Although this is a very interesting strategy that Merkstar has done. They've essentially capped Kappa and Epsilon, spreading their main body around to try and split up 228's team, and then essentially overwhelm one flank or the other with a brawl push. This is actually really smart. I like this strategy that Merkstar is employing. Phoenix Legion did it against Eon Synergy and MRBC last season to try and get the win. Isengrim did it against 228 to help get them the win. So we're going to see where this leads, but right now Kamichiwa is just not in a good position. He's going to get streaked by the Arctic Wolf, and this looks like it's going to be an early death for Kamichiwa. Yeah, he's probably not going to be doing well here right away, like you said. Sanistral will be All... getting the kill right away here as well. as. But you can see the top deck of 228, the guys on top are have are just not having a fun time sitting up there. They're kind of being... Not to say they're being impatient, but they just don't know what to do. Yep, and Kamichiwa predictably went down, but it looks as though that Merkstar is responding. A couple of the mechs from 228th aren't in position to properly respond to this push. If Merkstar can get start getting aggressive on this movement, but oh boy, they aren't oh boy, they are not going top level. They're going low. Yeah, this was actually a good move from 228 to move towards that bridge. They had a lot of firing lines to put on them because Crimson Helix is not doing good, loading the torso already as well as being yellow all over. Oh boy, I do I do not agree with this. Um, Merkstar took what was a promising push and split cap maneuver and essentially moved into a firing hole. Now they're just getting fire poured on them. Crimson Helix is at 44, Xavier's at 44, Black Templar's Raptor's at 44. I mean, sure, was... Lawrence, Elsa, and Seabiscuit are beat up, but the rest of their teams... Yeah, and it was good that they finally got the kill on Seabiscuit. You gotta start eliminating mechs as quick as you can, being down Kamichua and basically Xavier and Crimson Helix with a few more touches. I think that's what Senestral is going down there to do right now. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Although Drew and James Bond got to get in here quick if they want to help these guys out. You can see Nuclear Weapon and RJ Base 
having that Overwatch oh, on them. A team kill. Black Raptors killed his own teammate. That's not good. Oh, and Xavier's going to go down now. I'm sorry for interrupting, Belmont, but I had to point that out. Please. No, not a problem. Yeah, this is still a bad position for Drew and James Bond, as, like you said, with Nuclear, with Overwatch, Pickle Rick still there, who now has went down in Sinistral, who is apparently legged. Is he? No, but he is. Yeah, Torso gone. He's out. I am loving this last stand, though. This is like something you'd see in a movie. Drew the Blue and James Bond taking the smart maneuver to tuck into the cave to deny lines to the team, force 228 to respond by basically standing right in front of them and it looks like it's working they're bringing the match back these mad cat mark two c's are doing work right now drew the blues at 53 percent but lauren Selsa goes down in his dragon and rj base goes down in the mad cat two c oh my god this was a two mech advantage in the beginning and these two mad cats managed to turn it around by tucking it into the tunnel james bond and drew the blue taking the match back rj base self-destructed what how did they take this back yeah that was a i didn't see that going this way that's for sure at the end there but like i said when they started finishing those mechs off that were hurt that was the way to do it that was like something out of kill bill that was incredible they the two met march you see is literally just tucked into the tunnel conserve their armor said the team's dead we have to conserve ourselves the two man cat mark two c's went to town and it shows in the damage drew the blue redeeming himself from the early pick 631 damage james bond bringing james bond level accuracy in this match 800 damage four kills to assist those two mad cat mark twos carried and what are you seeing from 228 belmont damage wise i mean we're looking at pickler rick with 551 I mean, technically, you got four guys with 400 to up to upwards 500 damage, and then just Laura, Elsa, and the Dragon, and Seabiscuit, like 261 and 288, still respectable damages. I mean, they still got three mechs down, which I should probably take care of that. And you know what? This is Merkstar not giving up. That was an incredible posture that was taken. They tucked into the tunnel, and 228, unfortunately, did not make an intelligent move. Pushing in one at a time, poking that tunnel one at a time, and the Mad Cat Mark II sees pretty much back-to-back, -back, pulling something out of, an, out of an action movie. Basically redeemed the entire drop, doing a combined total of 1,500 damage. Or 1,400 damage. Actually, closer to 1,400. My mistake. But even still, incredible drop, incredible defensive posture. Way to go. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Way to go, James Bond. Way to go, Drew the Blue. James Bond living up to the name. Yeah, and we're looking at a 3-1 win for Merkstar. 20 kills to 18 kills. Still respectable on the... Uh... Wait, wait, wait. Three? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to, and... trying to do all this counting in my head because I don't know what's going on here. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, it is two kill death off, but Merkstar taking the 3-1 to one lead right now. Yep, and right now that lead is kind of what matters. I think that so long as Merkstar doesn't blunder, they might have this drop locked unless 228 can somehow come back and wipe out Merkstar with a 6-0 win. It uh, looks as though this match is going to go that way. Anyway, do these teams need to be sw No. Okay. Should, if you switch them last round, it should be correct now. Yeah, they yeah, were switched. Okay. Yeah, because this ensures, this already ensures first place for Merkstar. So that is them for first place Div A. So it is up to Death From Above to see if they can come back in this last drop and take the kill win from them in this drop five. This should be interesting to see. As well as while we wait, actually, you want to run them through the map strat on that? I want to give away some codes before I forget. Fair enough. First, we got to switch up the map. Yes, sir. So essentially what we're doing was that this is kind of the tale of two different this was the tale of two different parts in this match. Um, you had essentially T28 moving up to take the best range spots available 
um, on Team One's side. And as has been said before, Team One is definitely the more advantageous range spot, which is probably why Merckstar decided, you know what, we're just going to give it up. We're going to focus on brawling. We're going to get in close and get in their face. So they started moving throughout the map. They originally were setting up in Fox 7 and Echo 7 somewhat. And they were getting battered somewhat well by 228's range trades, but they weren't as accurate as they could be. It definitely felt like 228 Death from Above was missing shots they shouldn't have. So in the end, they sent the lights north to Kappa to take that point, right? And then after that, they sent their main body south to take Epsilon, essentially running a split cap strategy where the idea was to let 228 take the center at Theta but still have the two cap lead. And in the event things go our way, draw their team away from the center point and force them to separate. Now, what this allowed them what this allowed them to do is essentially split up 228's fire a little bit but in the end it wasn't really what they intended because unfortunately Kamichiwa got picked over here and uh, died doing a minimal 23 damage but I suppose that he did do his job in the end by capping Kappa but nothing else the biggest move however was Merkstar going under from Fox 5 and pushing through here now 228's range body was taking position wisely on these points and raining hell down upon Merkstar in this Echo 5 region. Merkstar really didn't have a good response time. If we're looking at the percentages, then, you know, the match would have been called then and there. Merkstar was bleeding mechs. I believe they lost three mechs to 228 one or two before they even got to this hole and pushed out. And then 228 did something that you could kind of say was a blunder. Instead of stacking mechs up on one side or the other or sending lights to the other side of the tunnel, what happened was that they did something like this. Merkstar stacked up in the tunnel here, and then they pushed out slightly. And then you have 228 here that's set up like this to receive them. Now, the Merkstar mechs that pushed out here were essentially dead, but the Mad Cat Mark II Cs that were left pulled back within this tunnel area right here, and 228 made a massive gaff. They did not establish a firing line. They did not all go trade at once. It was pretty much a leak attempt to try and get shots on those Mad Cat Mark II Cs, and those two Mad Cat Mark II Cs definitely had enough power to essentially destroy them. It was two Mad Cat Mark II Cs bringing all their fire to bear on mechs, and before you know it, what's essentially a 4-2 mech advantage turns into a win for Merkstar because 228 is leaking mechs, and Merkstar is just dropping them left and right, left and right, with superior focus fire from James Bond and from Drew the Blue. It was a very, ex it's a, it was a very clutch way, basically, to take the match back. And uh, I hope that uh, we can see some counterplay to 28th because they still might be able to have a chance to take first place if they come out on top for kills. But at the very least, they can show Merc Star that they are not to be reckoned with and that they deserve to, at the very least, move up to Div B now. Yeah. And it looks like we're ready to go. Let's launch this base. Rock and roll. Oh, why did I do that? I need to switch this sauce over. There we go. Can't pick my nose when it shows my face. Then people know. See, I actually want a face cam, in all honesty. Like, I don't know. I stroke my beard a lot, and I bite my lips, but I don't care. Those tendencies make a man. If you want to pick your nose on stream, you do it, Belmont. I know, I keep rubbing my face too much, like I got a mustache or a beard or something, but I just got stubble. But I did watch a video today about this guy talking about his daughter being a cyclist, waving at a, a lorry someplace in England, and while he's explaining to the newscaster what uh, what he does with his daughter, she picks her nose and then eats it on camera. And I was like, uh, well, you're never going to live that one down. Uh, yeah, no, I wouldn't live that down either if I, but you know what she does, she does get, she does get a little bit of, um, a little bit of wiggle room because she is a young woman, but, uh, but why yeah, don't we change the young. subject from boogers and talk about Max? Uh, what are you seeing, Belma? I'm looking at 228 side. We got RJ base and a Mad Cat 2CB, a dragon, Arctic wolf, Mad Cat 2CB again, and then the one for nuclear in the Mad Cat and another dragon 5N. So they have finished up their dragons for this drop. So they want to play some range. 
I mean, this is the last drop, so if you got range, you might as well bring it. 228th, bring in the pain with those dragons. They can definitely dish out a ton of damage on this very cold map. And once again, it seems like Merkstar might be taking a bit... Actually, they might be playing a trade game. The They have four crabs and two king... They have three crabs and two king crabs. I'm not sure if this is a joke deck or not, because this is all different sorts of crustaceans. This is the crustacean <laughs> deck right here. This is interesting, but it seems like, you know, 228th are not going to pull any punches in this match. They're pushing straight to Kappa with their entire team and force, and all that's there are two unfortunate lonely crabs without the guidance of their leader, King Crab. But they are pulling out in time, and it seems oh, like 228th yeah. might not have the speed to get them. They are going to get lucky here because you could. Yeah, it's funny. It's a funny deck. I mean, you still got six AC twos on each King Crab with two ER medium laser, so they do have extreme range. It's just an odd, definitely an odd choice. Uh, someone from Merkstar probably enjoyed self shellfish way too much when coming up with this deck idea, and it <laughs> seems as though it might not be assisting because Drew the Blue just got hammered with range fire, already down 84% in the first minutes of the match, and the King Crabs are showing why you don't necessarily take them. They are huge weapons platforms, but their hitboxes are not Ill, are not well advised. They're getting beat down with some withering range fire, and they're not trading at all with 228th. The percentages are pretty much the same as they've been in the beginning of the match, except RJ Base, who got hit with a terrible strike. What are you seeing, Belmont? Yeah, I'm watching. I'm in a bad position here watching these, these King Crabs try to put in work. Definitely an interesting way of doing things, but I could see this going. Well, Proto Talos, all that was about to get hit by a strike right here, right now, so. Yeah, down 89%. Just grazed him. But I think right they now, almost have the advantage from this point, but their crabs are just almost... They're useless right now. They need to get in close. And they that's exactly what they're position. doing. The, yeah, that's what they're doing. The crabs are doing their crab walk, slowly meandering their little crustacean-sized legs over to 228's position to try and get some extra damage in, but 228 recognizes this, and they're wisely starting to back off a little bit, trying to use get some range. But overall, it actually doesn't seem like it's working very well for T2 Ace. Lauren Celsa's already... Well, not Lauren Celsa, but it looked like one of the dragons were smoking a little bit there. But it looks like it was just my imagination, unfortunately. Well, you got a nuclear weapon at 86%, so it's starting not to go in favor of him. But, I mean, this will be an interesting way to see how this range game goes. I mean, the caps are still in favor of 228, so I don't think Merkstar has noticed that. And interesting to note that... Um, <laughs> Pickle Rick is just kind of hovering in the background with his streaks. Um, if this was SRMs, I would say that this is a very dangerous maneuver and that these king crabs are in serious trouble, but they're already in trouble anyway because the crabs are taking an extensive amount of fire, and unfortunately James Bomb's getting bombed to hell right now by AC fire, desperately trying to get to cover, but those king crab hitboxes are not doing him any favors. And then you have the Arctic Wolf by Pickle Rick coming in the background, dropping some streak fire. Yeah, they are way too wide, too locked up in there. You can see exactly, all those king crabs are just lit up hard. Damage numbers just not looking good for their side. Uh, I can only say that this deck might have been a fun deck because king crabs are just not very strong mechs to bring, and this is kind of the reason why, although the match isn't over yet. Uh, one of the dragons, I believe Lawrence Elsa, yeah, lost his arm, and now he's stripped, so essentially it's 5v6. Yeah, even Drew, RJ, leg drew the blue in that crab, so he's just a slow-walking, six-medium pulse machine. But even still, all this weakened damage, and 228 has not finished a mech. They need to get the focus fire. But they are two sticks, right? Because you said nuclear, or no. One of the dragons is a stick, and Sinestial is a stick. He's just got AMS. Although, where's Lawrence yeah, Elsa? I... Oh, it's Elsa. So he's, I think he's going to sneak out to cap. Oh my goodness. And it seems as though, despite the huge damage differences, oh, once again, Merkstar might pull this. Because there are so many hurt mechs on Merkstar. It's unbelievable. Like Pickle Rick and Seabiscuit. And still... this is, well, yeah, and this is the biggest problem with the streak mech that Pickle Rick brought. If he brought SRMs, this would be cleaning day for him. He would be getting breaking in kills and damage, but unfortunately now he's just getting damaged because those streaks can't focus down components. All those open components that are red, the streaks can't necessarily target them. So he's not 
that useful in the end game, and it's showing. Lawrence Selsa said 56%, but it's a def- deceptive 56% because he can't do anything, and I can't believe it. Wow. <laughs> the shellfish deck wins. I, oh man, after that awful, awful push with those king crabs when they got locked up in there, and they were all at like 60 to 70% damage, where, and I remember looking at 228's list, and they were all over 80. I can't believe it went that way. Holy crap. That was that insane. Was, Did not see that going to happen. That was, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm sorry, but this is great. Uh, <laughs> a crab themed deck pulled out with the win. This is incredible. Oh man, this so, is why you love BFM. So we can't even say it was a a throw deck because that would, it's five to one right now. Like, that's insane. Uh, I think MS could have uh, used some sous chefs from Benny Hanna to help them with this drop because they just got clamped. This is. <laughs> what what a match. That's all I've got to say. What a match. I mean, 228 still has a massive cap lead, but with time running out and no other no other place to go it's kind of kind of tough right now it really is and it, I'm just, it's yeah, an uphill just... battle and Lawrence Elsa isn't even in the miss links anymore he's in the dr- yeah I'm just watching Kamichi roll in with his deadly blood red vampire torso coming in because he wants to finish him off because it's not even like he can hurt him I don't know if you yeah could, pretty much you might be able to rub that torso off but that's it with yeah Hanna like weapons there the crabs, Kamichiwa at 44%, the Crimson Helix at 40 Drew the Blue at 53 It really doesn't matter. There's nothing else. To... Yeah, had uh, they, this... if they had a Piranha right now, you could clean up so quickly. Mm-hmm, definitely. Or even the Arctic Wolf with SRMs. Uh, yeah. It definitely felt like Pickle Rick kind of went in a little too ham with the streaks. If he had SRMs... I feel like he definitely could have pulled the match. He could have had a great day, and he could have went down in the annals of Div C BFM as the guy who clutched out the final drop for 2 2 8th. Death from above. As it stands, the streaks did him numbers and taking off components and properly focusing damage. Yeah. Oh, what? Enemy forces have Sigma. I was just, thought Drew the Blue was getting real close to Theta. He is don't, getting super close to Theta. This is don't uh Don't do it, don't do it. I mean uh, nah, they will ev- doing they it. will eventually find Lawrence and they will kill him. That's that's the way it's gonna go. Well, right now, even if the caps just stay the way they are, we're moving at a three point tick per second for Merkstar. So at around hundred and eighty, what is that? That's about uh five hundred and uh 570 seconds I want to say at a three tick rate that's about three and a half minutes so not too long of a wait all things but even still there's a mech sitting at gamma and that's all you need all that crab has to do is stand right there don't go anywhere crimson helix not crimson helix or is it crimson helix yeah I believe it is crimson helix helix where are you going buddy just turn your little crab self right around crab walk in the right direction there you go he sees him sees Elsa and this match is effectively over what a drop what a a drop (laughs) I I have no word what the frick Senna Shell unfortunately dropping in a chat saying that uh, 228 couldn't have spread their focus fire worse. I unfortunately couldn't have agreed more. Uh, the trades in the beginning were very good. The King Crabs were very weak, but at the end of the day, they didn't kill anything. They needed to kill something. And, you know, they didn't. They didn't finish. Incredible match, incredible way to end Div C. It was a 4-1 end, but uh, 
a very well earned four one in, and it was close all the way. Uh, not a lot of drops where you felt like one team or the other would just ran away with it. It felt like every drop could have been won one way or another. And Merckstar actually pulled out some very, very, very clutch wins in some of those drops. Just incredible way to end DC. Incredible. Yeah. Superb work by both teams. I mean, yeah, w walk me through those damage numbers. I mean, look at two to eight's numbers too. Like, wow. Like, I accidentally left. You're gonna have to do it. <laughs> I mean, we got Lawrence at 700, RJ at 724, Senestial in the Mad Cat at 159 because he was the first one in line to get stripped. But Pickle Rick in the Arctic Wolf at 634, and you look at MS. All even except for Crimson. Everyone's got like 330, 486, 573, 486, 543, and then Crimson in the Crab with 738. And this just comes down to Focus Fire, the difference between them. You know, like 228 to their credit, they were accurate with their shots in the opening trades, but the Focus Fire was just not there. And credit to Merc Star, their King Crabs were alternating out very well once they were within range to push. You could see that their King Crabs kind of left the action a little bit, left it to their normal smaller drone crabs to clean up the action. And um, just incredible. Like, incredible way to alter it in and out. And apparently we didn't do our homework. I don't know what Bumble C Lot MWO is referring to, but um, yeah, I, if you could, I know this is a five minute delay, but if you could like point that out, buddy, I'd. What is he talking about? I people? don't know. We might have missed something. I actually would always appreciate someone pointing out something that we might have missed, but. Uh... My thing reset, so all I have, I'm married at the the Moobot, so he says, I don't know. He's talking about the leaderboard for Isengrim. And I go down. And I don't know what he's saying. Um, fair enough. Uh, let's uh, start taking these people in for interviews, and then uh, we will move on to giveaway. Yeah, because I got one rolling right now. So let's. Oops, I'm still in this. Ah. Would you? Where am I? Kamichiwa. Hello, sir. Hey, what's up? Not too much. Just waiting Me. on 228 to send somebody. Definitely. What did you guys think? <laughs> of, of that last deck? Oh, <laughs> all the matches. Let's uh let's let's say let's save it for the interviews cuz okay. uh, this is definitely going to be this is going to be a very interesting Q&A. So Belmont, you want me to just take the reins with the question? You got some you want to ask now? Sure, you go ahead. Welcome in, Sea Biscuit. Hey, what's up, guys? Before I start, those are just some of the most incredible matches we've seen from Div C. Very close match, very well fought between you teams. Sea Biscuit, uh, you guys might have lost, but every single match was very close. And apart from some minor gaffes, which I want to go into right now, you guys played very well. So hats off to both of you guys. You made this division extremely interesting. Thank you very much. Now to stop with the rear end kissing and get to some questionnaires. Sea Biscuit, uh, to get into drop one, um, how do you feel? Well, actually, no, I'm sorry, Kamichiwa. This question will go to you. What did you do to prepare for that drop? Obviously, that was just a battle that was won in the Mech Lab. Uh, so, what did what did your team go through? What was the process to get ready for that drop? That first drop against uh, Death from Above. So we knew that we were going to bring streaks, and we didn't know if it was going to be drop one or drop two. But we talked it up enough that we were expecting it on drop two. We figured it'd be drop one. So we brought the biggest freaking tanky mech we could bring and just eight damage. And Excellent. Yeah, um, the AMS we threw in there last second just because we figured it'd help. And the flamers, you know, it's Terra Therma and more AMS. We got to bring flamers. Yeah, I think it was a good idea on both sides to bring the flamer and the, the AMS. Even one per mech, just, it, it, it could still make the difference. And now, Seabiscuit, from your side for drop one, it felt like that you guys were still doing the damage you needed to do. What did you guys try to do to compensate when you realized that they had SRMs, that they had AMS, that they had... Uh, we actually 
we, we assumed they were going to try and counter our deck somehow. Um, we still thought the deck was going to be strong enough to push through it. What actually beat us, I think, are the Flamers. The AMS, maybe a little bit, but the, the Flamers was a big... Well, we definitely watched it at the end. I think on the, one of the last two mechs, they put Flamers on you guys, and it was like, well, yeah, he's it's on the Kit Fox, and it was like, yeah, it's it's essentially done here. Yeah, those Huntsmen, they're not very heat efficient with the Six Streak Sixes. Um, so the Flamers actually pushing us up over the top. Uh, I probably did more internal damage to myself than they did to me. <laughs> and it actually showed because the damage numbers were pretty low, so I'm guessing that internal damage did have a factor. Now it's time to get to drop two a little bit. Um, Kamichiwa, I feel like the biggest thing in that match was that your Bushwhackers weren't able to use their range. Talk me through your idea with your deck in drop two and what you guys wanted to do and what you felt you weren't able to do against 228's push. Well, it was originally our streak counter deck. However, when we showed up and they brought streaks wave one, we kind of panicked a little bit because those mechs aren't... I mean, they're okay at taking out what we needed to do with the leg drop, but it, against another heavy drop like we saw with the two Orions, it just was not performing as well. And then we had a little bit of trouble making a concave there, and the Orions took advantage of that. Uh, yes, definitely. And now, Seabiscuit, talk me through your push the, through that drop. That drop, that push was definitely one of the best pushes I've seen out of Div C. Uh, as I said on the cast, it felt like the Piranhas went in to drop a little aggro, drop uh, Merc Star's crosshairs a little bit, so that way they're not aiming at the Orions. Buys you guys a couple seconds of time to get in, close in, and do a lot of damage. So what were, was that all intentional? What was the idea behind the push? Did you practice that? Talk me through it. Uh, that specific push we didn't practice. We've been trying to like work on our uh, pushing and forming concaves and like the order that we move in for all of our brawls. Um, and it actually came to fruition in, in that drop. Our number one focus was getting the legs on those bushwhackers. And I don't know if you saw the damage numbers at the end, but we were all like still like right at 200 damage at the end of the drop. wasn't a whole lot of damage, but uh, we were able to shoot what we needed to shoot out. Well, you know, that's uh, pretty self-evident. Like, you know, you don't need to do a lot of damage because, um, you know, unfortunately, 2-2-A actually led in damage throughout most of the matches, and the outcome is a different story. So now going to drop three. Um, drop three seemed like a bit conventional. Seabiscuit, from my perspective, and I think Belmont would agree, it felt like the biggest problem you guys had was that you were too close to the push. You got an early gank on Drew, who was in the roughneck, but it felt like that you guys didn't establish enough distance for your range deck to really do work. So talk me through what your team was thinking during that moment. Why were you guys so close? How come you didn't establish more range? What was your objective? So on drop three, our initial like gaff was to uh, to push up, take the the ridge on Theta from Team Two, and just trade with them until they pushed in. When we saw that they had linebackers, um, we decided to take Theta and shoot down on them as they were coming in. Uh, the, unfortunately, our annihilator just got yanked by the three linebackers, and uh, they, he got <coughs> torso from the back pretty quick. So. Uh, we still almost pulled that out um, there at the end, but I think the Annihilator being stuck by himself um, for even just the two seconds he was by himself was, was enough. And Kamichi, uh, looking at the push, it definitely seemed like it was very disjointed. As I said, Drew got picked early. Two of your linebackers were bumping into each other, which is why they did sub-300 damage compared to the rest of your team. And overall, it felt like the push was falling apart a little bit. What was in your guys' heads during that moment when the match was in the... Um, well, we definitely were a little bit concerned, and then we managed to have Black put some work in and managed to pick off both Miss Links and the Annihilator, which helped. Um, when RJ blew himself up, oh my word, we all breathed this sigh of relief there. So, um, we managed to pick pretty tanky mechs for what we brought, and I think that really helped. And they just weren't able to take us all down. I would actually agree with that because it definitely felt as though that um, in the end, the you guys were just able to withstand withering fire. And I believe even Drew, who got you know, he was um, he still did around 200 damage. 
And now moving on to drop four, Seabiscuit. This is the drop that really caught my eye. This is probably the most interesting well, actually, no, second most interesting drop. That goes to drop five. We'll go into that later. But, um, <laughs> sorry. But, um, during that drop, you guys definitely had a lead. You got three kills before, um, Merc Star even went into the tunnel. Um, what, why didn't you guys say surround the tunnel? Why did you all just establish a frontal concave? What was the idea once Merc Star cleared the tunnel? Uh, the idea was to not let them shoot us from the tunnel so make sure they didn't have eyes on us and kill the stuff that was on our unfortunately we didn't really do that very well and uh, when, when we actually started shooting at them we were already hurt enough I, I know RJ was already heat capped and I ended up blowing himself up there too but, um, I mean that's it happens sometimes but uh, I, I think we actually lost that match when I got picked off myself uh there as the first death on our team uh yes you were and you know what though the range trades were still looking very good the mad cat mark two c's were just doing work but you got some early light picks so how come you guys didn't say establish two different lines instead of going i think you got caught uh, out there yeah you got caught Oh, I'm sorry. How come you guys didn't establish two different firing lines across the tunnel instead of one, or instead just back off the tunnel and wait for the Mad Cat Mark II Cs to push out together? Since I believe you guys did, well, well, actually, you didn't have a cap lead, but at the end, the caps were still slow, and the Mad Cat Mark II Cs weren't that much. Yeah, our initial uh, idea for that was um, when they we figured they were going to push you out underneath. That happened in the scrim that we, we did on that match, too. Our opponents did the exact same thing. Um, and the goal was to actually have a couple of people across for them to shoot at, while most of our team with AC2s is still shooting in the back from up top in Echo 4, and it, it didn't work out the way we had planned uh, there. And now, Kamichi ought to go into your head. Was the split, was the idea to cap Kappa and Epsilon intentional to try and split 2-2? Two -two? Um, well, I will say that I think... Well, we definitely were trying to pull them out and try to force them to try to push us with mid-range, which is why we tried to play the cap game a little. However, when we saw the opportunity to move all our mechs up the left side on the Epsilon side, we decided to take it and try to close range. And by that point, we had the Marauder and the Jaeger mech pulled way out. And another theme I think we noticed between drop four and five is we picked that Dragon's right arm right off the bat, which really helped cut their DPS in half. And uh, they just, they focused on our Orions, which is the main point of that strat. The Orions just, they don't even have to shoot. They can just sit there and take damage and the Mad Cats will just take care of it. Uh, and now just a quick question. What was going on in comms when James Bond, pretty much reenacting James Bond in all his movies and Drew redeeming himself with both of them pulling a combined 1400 to 1500 damage with five kills? Oh, we were just screaming at them not to blow themselves up. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And now, Kamichi, uh, drop five. What the hell was... So that was what MS likes to call crabs. And we decided to bring it out. And then we noticed that a lot of the enemy team had weapons in the arms. And they don't have a lot of armor there. So... We just closed range and peeled off arms left and right. I mean, we stripped every mech. It was like 5v1, and or it was like nobody was dead, but the other team just didn't have any guns. Well, because it looked bad when you guys came in. Like the crabs pushed off, came in, put the, pushed the rush, came in on the left, and the king crabs came in on straight, and you guys pulled up on left ridge, the left ridge, the right ridge, and the center, and you guys were all like 60. 60 70 percent or it's like two to eight was still fresh at that point and then it all went everything changed after that well we we allowed the king crabs to take a lot of damage and two two eight just failed to focus the crabs and we just peeled off arms with those medium pulse lasers both the dragons lost their arms early the mad cat mark two lost its arms almost instantaneously I think it was as soon as we cleared that ridge exactly yeah yeah, when you guys came around with the crabs, uh, Sinistral was a little too far forward, and he was actually surrounded by the... He had all three of the smaller crabs in his back, 
and the all three of the bigger mech the crabs right in right in front of him. I think he only did like a hundred something damage in the drop with his mech yet. So yeah, our goal with that is just to create as much chaos as possible, and just if we start calling components, and it becomes everyone's goal to take that component. And now, Sea Biscuits. Um, I think we already all know that the biggest downfall was Focus Fire, but I think something that's a little under the radar, something that I've been harping on, was that the Arctic Wolf brought streaks instead of regular SRMs. If he brought SRMs instead of streaks, this match could have ended very differently because then he could have actually focused the components necessary to kill the mechs. How come he stuck with the? Yeah, we were actually trying to decide at the start there uh, what exactly he was going to be bringing. Um, and for a while, we thought we were going to end up playing a cap game on Grim um, and decided that if we were going to win a cap game against Lights uh, and then having a Light uh, article for Streaks was the best way to answer it. So um, that's what, what we ended up going with. About 10 seconds into the us seeing them in Crabs, we go, shit, we should have taken this Rams. Uh, fair enough. You know, hindsight's twenty twenty. You can't see into the future, but still, uh, great job nonetheless. Now, Kamichiwa, this is the final question of the interview. What will you do when you're in that crab deck against boiling water and hot butter? Just <laughs> well, Get taste. All I say to that is two two eight death from crabs. Uh, <laughs> oh man. Oh boy! Hopefully we have a little rivalry going on. But anyway, it was uh, it was a great match, you know, incredible match by both of you guys. Very well played. Thank you. Yeah, there's yeah. great matches to watch. I'm happy, yeah, to, say, like, I'm happy to catch like this. Twenty to it's like twenty to nineteen going into the last game. Something mm -hmm. like that. Twenty to Very eighteen. Yeah. <laughs> I'd That's like to say thank you to all the div division scenes, especially Cameron's Highlanders and Aces Wild, because we've seen them multiple times, but just making this division probably the best out of yeah. all. And more than just because it's just our division, it, it was also a very fun experience, and I just didn't see some of the quality of matches that I saw like between the teams in our division versus other divisions. Yeah, I think, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I really enjoyed all the matches this season. Um, I know going into drop five, you guys had already won on points for uh, for actual Battle for Midway, so congratulations on your victory for Battle for Midway. Thank you very um, much. Yeah, uh, as we were tied going into this, this yeah. match here. Um, that being said, eh, I think it was still anybody's day. Oh, they were still... Uh, they were close. Oh, yeah. So... Um, Hopefully we'll see you in Div B. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Thank you for the matches, guys. Hey, no problem. You guys brought it. Um, it's what we've been looking for all season. So, and you guys brought it. Yeah. Well, thanks for guys for coming. Uh, Merc Star Kimichiwa, good job on the win. Div C champs. Div C. Yeah, Div C champs. Two two eight. See Biscuit and your team. Death from above. Good job on getting second place. Great matches, guys. I'd like to thank you for having us. Thanks for casting. Yeah, that was a great guest. I, I'm actually going to sit back and watch the whole thing. Again, so. <laughs> it was good, but I'll let you guys Also, go. thank you. Thank the guys in the crowd for showing up. I mean, we wouldn't do what we'd be doing to have as much fun if you guys weren't here. Yeah, I'm glad we had yeah. people. And taking prizes for once. Yeah, so the, uh, the way it looked, I, I believe we had the largest cast today out of all of the the cast of matches for Battle for Midway. Unfortunately not, because um, well, for... CSJ versus Imperial got up to 100 viewers last uh, time. So close. Uh, you were close, okay. but... It'll be the biggest uh, for MRBC, yeah. too, for sure. Yes. Also, <laughs> all those like secret MS fans out in the chat that are afraid to support us because we thought 228 was going to crush us, go ahead and put a hashtag <laughs> MS Crab people in the chat, please. Yeah, and for you guys that hate uh, 228, we're not Blackwatch or Swamp Foxes, so we actually <laughs> like to have fun. <laughs> That's okay. I got love for everybody. Except for this one guy. <laughs> you know is his name is. RJ? No, RJ's fine. Okay. As long as you hold box for him. There's only one guy I don't like, and he's banned, so it's fine. Oh, okay. That guy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So is uh, Dropship 5 going to come back together for uh, 
MRBC? No. We're just well, we're, we're trying to steal them. Hey, no, don't leave no, you start. No, say, so no, I got no, a spot no. on my <laughs> roster for some for some dropship five guys. No, no, dropship five's done. Also, see biscuit. We're gonna thank you guys for not withdrawing five minutes after the match after you got lost to Craig. No, oh, shots fired. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. Kami's. I'm Kamichi. I was really trying to push this rivalry next season. You better bring the. Oh, he posted on Reddit too. We've, oh, nice. we've actually been talking crap to each other all season. So. <laughs> nice. <laughs> gotta, have some, see. gotta have, gotta have so some long as it's, So long as it's sportsman like, so long as it stays sportsman like, nothing. Oh, yeah. We'd love to play 2 2 8, and we're so glad for these matches tonight. It was a ton of fun. Yeah, so regardless, add me, and we can do some scrims like between seasons. So I know it's a good match. Also, I wanna I wanna stress this, Sea Biscuit. D five is done. D O N E done. They're not playing M W N E. All right. With that being said, uh, like Blake Town and you know, well, Saruman, if you want, um, there's yeah, an open no. invitation to Death. <laughs> I'm I'm a busy man. Sorry, but th- thank you for the thank you for the invite. I appreciate. Awkward. Keep the peer pressure. Off. It's not Wait, is the losing keep is keep the, keep pushing though? You know, is the like losing team allowed to recruit people. Yes, yeah. they are. That's yes. Generally, that's how it works. You know, like you go go to the NFL, NBA, MLB. The teams that lose more have more salary cap, higher draft picks. So yes, see biscuit recruit away. I applaud you. Good. I'll um <laughs> I'll hook you up with Blake Town. We'll see what happens. Uh, he's been dropping with us in our practices. So. What a dick! He told he was gonna drop with us. Please. <laughs> well, you see, Belmont Blake Town's kind of like you know he's a he's a street walking kind of guy, so Always he's gonna be around quite a few. Yeah, he's a he's a wanderer. You know, he likes to be around the poles and the nightclubs. He likes to show himself a lot to different teams. So you know, yeah, he's a good guy, but he might be around a couple teams. So yeah, be aware of that. Well, we'll see. MS came into this as their first season, and we just want to, you know, get some notice. So I hope I um, see we've done that now, and I hope we're going to be a little bit more than just generation faction players. I hope yeah, so. so you, yeah, you Maybe guys we, did great this season. I know uh, I've only had this Death Row Buck team together for two or three months now. I think three now. So, uh, we're still pretty new, even though Death from Above already existed. I think this is a whole new team. Well, it was so much fun playing you guys. Thanks for the matches. Yep. All right. All right. Good, you guys out of here. good matches, guys. Great matches. Uh, have a good night, and um, good luck next Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. That's all cleaned up. Uh, take care of all the, the prizes. I will after this is done because I gotta switch the chat around. But uh, I will probably there's one more match. Well, I think there's a few more matches left to, to do. But I will probably no one's called the the LRM Synergy versus Russian Jade Falcon on Monday, eleven o'clock Mountain Time. So I'm probably gonna try and take that because it is the second last match of the season, and that'll be it for me because there's one more match on Thursday, but at twelve thirty. So. Interesting. So, what time would it be? Eleven o'clock p.m. or? 8? It is eleven a.m. And um, what day is that? Monday. Monday. Ooh, just gonna a, find another co-caster. It's a holiday in Canada, so I'm good to go here. What day is it again? The twelfth. Yeah, the yeah Monday. find another co-caster. Yep, can't do it. Sorry, I wish I could. That's gonna be an amazing match regretting missing it but unfortunately Saruman has to uh, Saruman has to raise funds to properly equip his Orthang so well good luck with that he has to rake in the gold coins in order to uh, allure some mercenary orcs from Mordor well you stay away from those bitcoins okay, it's a dangerous game to play oh no not bitcoins um, gold <laughs> coins forged from the fires of Mount Doom so just as da- just you know in a different way yeah well, thanks again, Saruman, for co-casting with me. I was glad to have you. I was glad to have you too, Belmont. Great matches, great cast. And I'm glad Large. everybody. Go ahead, oh, sorry. sorry, go on. No, 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 you. 
Well, I'm glad everybody in chat was here to work the new method to get to actually take their free stuff because I'm, I'm happy to give stuff away since we got so much of it. So thanks to the fans. And right now, chat is being spammed somewhat with hashtag MS crab people. <laughs> Uh, some people saying Microsoft crab people. Uh, if we can get a multiple sclerosis crab people, that'd be pretty funny too. But no, nothing wrong with what we got. Uh, and yeah, you're a gentleman and a scholar. Always a pleasure. Thank you. And that'll be it for the drop. So hopefully we see you guys on Monday. See you later, chat. Only you can make this happen. Yeah. Have a good night, Space Cowboys. Good night. <laughs>